Well, welcome everyone to our webinar, How to Prove Your Renewable Energy Development Will Revitalize Local Communities. This session is being recorded and will be available after the session. We'll email the link out to you when it's available. And we will have time for questions at the end. So feel free to leave questions in the chat, but we will be responding at the end of the presentation. So we'll get started with uh, a brief introduction of uh, Dr. Loomis. Dr. Dave Loomis is president of SER and also Emeritus Professor of Economics at Illinois State University and co-founder of the Center for Renewable Energy. He has over 20 years of experience in energy analysis and has performed economic development analyses at the county, region, state, and national levels for many different energy projects and associated supply chains. Dr. Loomis has testified before numerous state level siting commissions and county boards, having performed testimony for renewable energy projects over 80 times. He's a widely recognized expert and has been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes Magazine, Associated Press, and Chicago Tribune, as well as appearing on CNN. Dr. Loomis has published over 40 peer-reviewed article, articles in leading energy policy and economics journals. He has raised and managed over $8 million in grant and contracts from government, corporate, and foundation sources. Dr. Loomis received his PhD in economics from Temple University in 1995. Dave, take it away. Thank you, Ethan, for that introduction. We really want to talk uh, today about how renewable energy projects can help um, local communities. And most of these are in uh, smaller, rural, uh, less densely populated areas. In particular, we're going to look at utility scale um, projects that might be uh, located uh, further away. And I think um, what I've seen again and again is that the community really lacks an understanding of the economic benefits. And that's a problem for developers as they go to talk with the local community. Um, they really don't uh, get a grasp of what this would mean for their, um, you know, their their county, their township, uh, their uh, local area. Uh, this was highlighted, and I'm glad to see that there's a, a number of researchers that, from NREL and uh, from Lawrence Berkeley National Labs that are taking up. Uh, this as an area of research. And then there was a recent uh, article uh, that came out in uh, Energy Research and Social Science. Uh, it was um, done by one, two, three, four, five, six or seven uh, authors uh, on the paper, but it just came out in February of 2024. And in uh, the lead author is Bissett, and in the Bissett article, it says, the potential economic benefits of a large scale solar uh, project to a community in the US might include increased property tax revenue, landowner payment, increased employment, but few peer reviewed studies examine local or sub state data. Of these impacts, we found that uh, those most often mentioned and salient to the community members and local officials were the local electrician and landscaper contracts generated by uh, the large scale solar development and increased business at the local level, uh, especially during construction. And I've seen that uh, in my own experience uh, again and again, they'll talk about, um, th they'll have a relatively small uh, contract that'll be uh, uh, the focus um, because somebody shows up to the meeting uh, at the permitting and say, hey, I'm in support of this project because um, we may uh, see uh, enhanced revenue. But in my experience, that has been a very small slice of the economic benefits that would come to a local community. And in particular, we're gonna talk about the local tax revenues uh, as well as local spending, but it, and here's the final quote from this article. While the most significant of these impacts to a community may be tax revenue, few residents spoke uh, with were aware of local tax revenues increasing as a result of the solar project. 
and those that could, uh, they few could accurately describe the amount or impact or perceive its generation or use by local and government, uh, state governments positively. And this is especially true of large um, projects. I think it's a problem in many cases of large numbers. They're uh, very large numbers that uh, folks are looking at. And so it's hard for um, uh, local decision makers to get their hands around uh, what impact that would uh, make. There was another uh, survey that came out late uh, last year done by Embold uh, Research in partnership with Tigercom. And they looked in, um, they surveyed, this is a broader survey, 2,645 uh, rural, rural Americans. Um, and they were surveyed last summer, August 9th through um, 16th. And uh, particularly, they're looking at a survey for uh, rural American support of renewable energy projects in their uh, community. And what, um, what they found was that um, even if they know the numbers, sometimes uh, a community doesn't trust the numbers, especially if it's coming uh, directly from a developer. So you can see the two questions here that we uh, pulled out. Renewable energy projects will not bring as many high paying jobs to rural communities as developers promise. Uh, again, there's um, uh, uh, the strongly agree and somewhat agree are fairly high to this question. And rural communities are being asked to host renewable energy projects, uh, but other communities will see most of the benefits. Um, and uh, again, a large percentage would agree or somewhat agree uh, with this statement. So it, there's this disconnect because the numbers and the analysis uh, show that really they are there are significant benefits that do flow from these uh, projects to the local community. And yet uh, the community may not trust uh, the um, developer because they're self-interested, self, -interested, self uh, um, uh, um, you know, in it for the, their project and what they can get out of it. And so there's this um, uh, distrust uh, of the numbers that are coming. But um, even so, there's community members that may understand the numbers, they trust the numbers, but they may say, well, it's what's in it um, for me? How do, is it going to uh, impact me directly? If I'm not one of the landowners that are leasing uh, land, I don't uh, see a benefit, even if I'm in this community uh, for, uh, for me. And so uh, one of the difficulties for developers is to try and uh, overcome that challenge and say, no, there are benefits to everybody in the community, uh, in the and especially the clearest way to see that is in property tax uh, revenue that uh, will will flow to schools, county government, and others that we'll get into a little bit later. So, our uh, solution is to provide an economic impact uh, study that will detail here are the jobs. Here are the types of jobs that will, will um, be created uh, or supported by uh, the project. And we have an experienced team to be able to explain those benefits to the local community. We put together what I uh, like to think is a very uh, comprehensive report. We look at um, the local community in terms of um, many uh, rural communities are seeing population declines, uh, so we'll look at their data uh, over time because the local community oftentimes isn't aware of their own um, economic conditions uh, and their own uh, data. And um, through that report and also uh, testimony or coming to public um, meetings, landowner meetings, and so forth, uh, we've had lots of experience in explaining this to local uh, landowners. This is just uh, a copy of one of our uh, report um, covers. We go into great detail to let them know that they can trust these numbers. We explain our methodology. 
uh, which you know may be uh, boring to some. Uh, I recognize that I'm a former economics professor, so I I really uh, like the methodology section. But I think it's important because it goes to the reliability and trust uh, of the numbers uh, that they can use uh, in in their community. We use the latest industry uh, data, and we've performed, as Ethan said, over 300 of these types of uh, analyses. So we try and make it relevant to the community uh, and let them know why they should care about uh, their numbers. There's a, a, a slide from Marion County, and you can see this is very, very typical of rural counties uh, and um, uh, of the population decline. And so we try and um, not be judgmental of the community but just say, here's what you've been faced with over the last uh, decade or so. And then we go through in the property tax section to itemize specific taxing entities uh, so that it's not just one big number, but we can say, here's how much goes to each individual school district. Certainly that's based on the project footprint, which may be subject to, um, uh, to change uh, over time but it gives them an idea of the order of magnitude that will come to the fire district, to, to the park district, to the library district, and uh, all those individuals taxing uh, entities that are in the project footprint. So again, we've had experience in uh, uh, 32 different states um, here um, uh, in which we've done uh, reports and we're happy to add other uh, states. So if you don't see your state represented here, uh, we can uh, certainly uh, accommodate um, that and uh, learn how property taxes work in uh, other states that we haven't had the experience in yet. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Tankin or actually for Ethan to introduce Chris. Thanks, Dave. Christopher Thankin is our economic analyst and assists with the production of the economic impact studies, including sourcing, analyzing, and graphing government data, and perform performing property tax analysis for wind, solar, and transmission projects. Thankin has a Bachelor of Science degree in sustainable and renewable energy and minored in economics. Thank you for the introduction, Ethan, and hello, everyone. It's great to be with you all. Uh, for my portion of the presentation, I'm going to be talking about the terms and definitions that we use within our economic impact studies. So uh, let's start with the basic overview. So for any uh, economic impact analysis, we start with a study area, in this case, a project county or a project state. And then we divide it into two time periods, a construction period, which lasts about zero to three years, and then an operations period, which lasts about 25 to 50 years. Within each of those periods, we measure three levels of economic impact, a direct level, an indirect level, and an induced level. And then within each of those three levels, we report economic impacts in the form of jobs, earnings, and output. So for example, on the construction side, you could have direct jobs, construction period indirect earnings, or construction period induced output. And the same thing works on the operations side. Uh, because these two are two different time periods with two different sets of costs, we keep uh, the economic impact separate for both of them. The basic hierarchy, however, does also apply to the project state side of things as well. So let's first dive into those three levels, the direct, indirect, and induced. On the direct side uh, for the construction, I want you all to think of the phrase on-site personnel. So direct impacts on the construction side refer to the on-site construction personnel that are sourced from your project county or your project state. So things like your construction workers, equipment operators, concrete pourers, electricians, all those kinds of jobs. And the same thing applies to the operation side as well on-site personnel. So your site managers, field technicians, o and workers, or clerical workers and staff, if you have those, uh, all pertain to the direct impacts. The next level of impacts are the indirect impacts. And for this one, I want you all to think supply chain impacts. Uh, they result from the inter-industry inter purchases resulting from the direct final demand changes. But what that really means is 
uh, these indirect impacts are stemming from your materials, equipment, services, spending that you do within the study area. So for wind construction, if you're purchasing uh, concrete and rebar, gravel, and transportation services from your project county and state, those will be reflected in the indirect impacts. If you're building a solar farm and you can buy piles and fences and racking from your project county or state, those will also show up as indirect impacts. On the operation side, it's a similar situation. If you're buying repair supplies and tools, electrical equipment, um, external uh, uh, services such as repair services or vegetation management, those are reflected as operations indirect impacts. And your property tax payments, those effects are being shown as indirect impacts as well on the operation side. The final level of impacts are known as induced impacts. And for this level, I want you to think community spending. So you have these direct uh, level workers and indirect level workers that are resulting from your project they are receiving a paycheck and they're spending that paycheck within the local community at restaurants and bars and grocery stores, hospitals, things like that. So there is this increase in spending that results from your project and those impacts of that increased spending within the local community are known as induced impacts. If you are giving landowner payments, land lease payments throughout the operations period, though that increase in spending in the local community as a result of those payments are reflected in the induced impacts level. So now that we've uh, talked about the direct level, indirect and induced levels, uh, let's look at the uh, jobs, earnings and output a little closer. So in our reports, we show jobs as full-time equivalents and the conversion factor is one job equals one FDE, which equals about 2,080 hours per year, which is about a full-time worker working for one year. Now, the reason we use FTEs is so that we can accommodate those part-time or temporary workers that are working on your project. So uh, a full-timer working for just 0.6 of a year on your project would be 0.6 FTE. They are a full-timer. However, their entire the entirety of their time is not being spent on your project. They could be working on other things, and therefore the time that they are working on your project would only be what we count towards the FTE. Similarly, if you had two full-timers only working for half a year, their combined total would be one FTE. And a similar situation occurs for the part-timers. So a uh, part-timer presumably working for 1,040 hours in a year would be 0.5 FTE. And if you were to double that, the combined FTE of those two part-timers working for one year would be one FTE. So the, the main takeaway is that there's there's many ways to arrive at one FTE and that the um, numbers that we report at the direct, indirect, and induced level are these sum of many portions of FTEs. So um, if you see a number like 75.6 jobs, that 0.6 refers to a person whose portion of the time is being dedicated to your project and that that 75 doesn't necessarily mean 75 workers or 75 boots on the ground, but the amount of work that is to be done, which can be satisfied with many different combinations of full, part-time, and temporary workers. As for earnings and output, earnings is pretty much what you would think, uh, the wages, the salary, and the benefits that result from a job. So a lot of this time is being done with union labor, which, was, uh, which we uh, count into our economic impacts. And then output is akin to GDP, so the, the sum value of all the goods and services that are being done at the direct, indirect, and induced level. So labor spending, land lease payments, easements, uh, taxes, a major, equi major equipment spending, intermediate input, supply chain inputs, um, all the value of all those things combined together for your output impacts at the direct, indirect, and induced level. Um, some other considerations I want to run through real quick are that your impacts are determined by the, by number one, the robustness of your steady area economy and the amount of spending you're doing in that economy. So some of you are building projects in these really rural areas that have low populations and don't have a, a robust enough economy to, to source uh, major equipment or intermediate inputs from. So as a result, you should adjust your expectations for the impacts because you're study area economy simply just doesn't have enough supply to meet your demand. The other thing is some of you have contracts with other vendors or suppliers outside of the study area, 
And because you're spending money outside of the study area, that money isn't being spent or isn't creating impacts within the study area. So a couple of things to keep in mind when uh, thinking about what your potential impacts would be in your for your project. And then a, a simple disclaimer that like our results are not intended to be a precise forecast. They are an estimate of potential activity resulting from specific sets of projects and scenarios. Uh, so in review, we have our study area. We have the two different time periods we measure. We have that direct level of impacts, which are the on-site personnel. We have the indirect level of impacts, which are the supply chain. And then we have those induced impacts, which is the community spending. And then with each of those levels, we have jobs, earnings, and output. Another way to look at this uh, set of information is in table form. So here we have some uh, impacts from one of the reports we've made. It's the same basic format as what I showed before in that hierarchical map, but we have uh, this in table form. We have the county and the state side. We have the two construction periods, the two operation periods, the direct, indirect, and induced levels of impact for each table, as well as the jobs earning as output. Uh, in this slide, though, we have that total level, that total uh, row in each of the tables. And that total is the sum of the above direct, indirect, and induced impacts. Um, one thing to point out is because the county is within the state, the state impacts will always be greater than or equal to the county impacts. So if you were to subtract the county impacts from the state impacts, that remainder would be the impacts happening outside of the project county, but within the project state. And the other important thing to note is that on this slide, there are 48 data points. 48 data points that you could be telling your local community about what your project will bring. And sometimes for like other projects, I'll only see like just the construction worker numbers or maybe some property tax information, but that's not really the whole picture. If you were to think of your project like a rock hitting a pond surface, uh, your project initially hits the surface and that creates that first ripple effect of jobs, of construction worker jobs. And that's what you would show to your community. And that, you know, it's nice, it's what they wanna know, but it's not really the full story. With our economic impact reports, you're getting that full picture. You're getting those construction worker impacts, but you're also getting supply chain impacts and that community spending. And so now you, with our reports, you're getting 48 data points that tell the entire picture that you could then communicate to your local community. And uh, that's it for me. So I will turn it back over to Ethan. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Chris. Next up is Brian Loomis. Brian Loomis is vice president at SER and has been conducting economic impact, property tax, and land use analysis at Strategic Economic Research since 2019. He has performed or overseen over 200 wind and solar analyses and has also provided expert testimony for permitting hearings and open houses. He improved the property tax analysis methodology at SER by researching various state taxing laws and implementing depreciation, taxing jurisdiction, millage rates, and other factors into the tax analysis tool. Brian received his MBA from Belmont University in 2016. Hello, I'm excited to be with you today. Um, was looking through the attendee list and saw some familiar names in there. So excited to share a little, little bit about property tax with you all. <clears throat> so property taxes for renewable energy projects um, are a little bit different from economic impacts in, in how you um, calculate them, where economic impacts you know, a job is a job, no matter what state it's in, the output generally looks the same. Every state is is a little bit different in terms of property tax legislation that's typically done at the state level, determined how they're going to tax renewable energy projects, whether there's an abatement or a replacement tax or what the situation looks like. And so we really see three categories um, for how projects are taxed. And it'll depend on the state, which one of these or which combination of these is applicable. We have some states that are taxed based on the nameplate capacity for the project. 
some that are taxed based on their energy generations, how many kilowatt hours are generated in a given year, or the third way would be based on their capital expenditures. Um, and that'd be sort of ordinary property taxes applied the same way to renewable projects as they are to any other type of capital infusion uh, would be sort of the, the based on capital expenditures or the cost method of uh, personal property. Um, and th there is um, generally personal and real property um, for capital expenditure projects. So, um, you know, you think about normal types of property, you can pretty easily separate, you know, my laptop would be personal property, my real, pr my uh, house would be real property, because it's permanent and affixed to the ground, it gets a little trickier with solar and wind projects determining which portions are personal and which portions are real property, because some, um, you know, it, it could be that a portion of your project is classified as real, another portion is classified as personal, and that can vary based on the state which types of equipment are considered real or personal property. So there's a lot of variance here in how property tax is done in a given state. Other differences would be how the land is treated. You know, if there's the replacement tax, is the land included in that? Is there a set, you know, base rate for the land associated with a solar project that's different than agricultural land? How is the assessor going to handle that? Um, how educational state aid is going to be affected by the increased taxable value in many states? They um, they receive state aid based on a, a complex formula where if you have an infusion of new taxable value, that school district may receive less in state aid as a result because the state doesn't think they need as much. And so that can be very different depending on which state you're in. You could see no reduction. You could see basically a one-to-one -one reduction in state aid. Um, and then what abatements are available for renewable projects changes in each each given state. So there are a lot of different factors that go into calculating these property taxes. And for every single state, you know, we're working on, we've gone into the tax code, we've figured out exactly how property taxes work, done research, created um templates for calculating property taxes and um we have a you know having done 32 states now we have a large degree of expertise in this area i wanted to give an example of how property taxes work i chose south dakota because it's somewhat i think understandable and if i use big round numbers hopefully everyone can follow me here but i won't go into too much of the uh the the math detail of it i'll try to keep it as high level as i can um some of you may be very excited as i am about getting into the math but i'll hold off for those of you who may not be as excited about math as I am. So um, in South Dakota, you have a full abatement of ordinary real and personal property taxes in favor of, they call it an alternative annual tax. That's the same thing as a, replace, a place, replacement tax. Um, you might see payment in lieu of taxes, you know, different states will call it different things. In South Dakota, it's called an alternative annual tax. Um, so um, a anything greater than five megawatts is going to be eligible for this abatement, and it includes the collector system for a facility. Uh, there are different taxes paid. This is one of those combinations that I was talking about where there is a nameplate capacity tax and then an additional generation tax, depending on your kilowatt hours generated in a given year. And the generation tax is, has a difference for wind and for solar. Um, then how that tax is distributed is also unique in South Dakota. 
this is set by statute, 80% of that generation tax goes to the state general fund, the remaining 20% of the generation tax and 100% of the nameplate capacity tax goes to the county treasurer, and the treasurer is directed to distribute the funds they receive in the following manner, 50% to the relevant school districts, 35% to the county, and 15% to the relevant organized townships. That's a bit unusual. Um, Wisconsin has somewhat similar legislation where the distribution is set by statute, but most states you're going to see the county treasurer distribute any funds that they receive according to the relative millage rates of um, the jurisdiction. So you would see, you know, if if 75% uh, or if, you know, if the school district's tax rate was 15 mils and the county's tax rate was five mils and there were no other jurisdictions in the area, just for the purposes of example, then if the county treasurer, when they received the alternative tax, they'd give 75% to the school district, 25% to the county. And so they sort of they sort of meet it out in the, the way that it's typically given out in the county. South Dakota is a little different where it's distributed in this unique way. So the other thing that you need to take into account, and I have my my math here, I'm showing my work, but I'm not going to uh, to read out any numbers for you. But the other thing that you need to take into account with your projects, particularly for wind projects that typically have a, a, a larger footprint, is you might be in multiple townships, multiple school districts, multiple fire districts. And so you need to take that into account when you calculate your property taxes expected as well. You know, if there's a school district right here, I have for this example, 80% of the project is in school district A, that'd be 80% of, of the turbines located school district A, 20% in school district B. Even if school district B has a higher tax rate, they're going to get less property taxes. And, and in South Dakota, because of the way that it's calculated where school districts just get a blank, uh, flat 50% of the alternative tax, you take that, the remaining $345,000, multiply by the 50% that they get, multiply again by the 80% that they get to get 138,000. So you've got to sort of work from what does the tax code say? What are the inputs that we need in terms of capital expenditure? Are there any intangible costs that we need to exclude? Um, what uh, what's the calculation for figuring out total tax and then how is it distributed to the jurisdictions? That's essentially how property taxes work. And like I've been saying, the variation by state can be quite significant, but having a really good understanding of the property taxes that you're expecting to pay is essential for your permitting meetings and hearings. And depending on the state, it could be quite a large amount of property taxes that you're expecting to pay. Some states are, are less to incentivize renewable energy coming into the area, but whatever the case, those permitting me meetings and hearing, they're gonna wanna know what property taxes that they can expect because it's one of the big benefits to them of you coming to their community. So we've done analyses in 32 states. We provide expert testimony for property taxes all of the time. We also have looked at um, comparison between agricultural and solar property taxes for those states in particular um, where the land is included in an in alternative tax. So you're taking agricultural land that was paying property tax um, is no longer going to be paying while a solar project is, um, is active. And so what's the difference there? How much more can they expect under solar? It's almost always very 
you know, a, quite a bit more under solar than it was under agriculture, just because the the scale of those two and the capital infusion and, you know, even with um, replacement taxes, payment in lieu of taxes, it's almost always going to be greater than what they were getting under agriculture. Uh, my next section here is land use analysis. I know I see we we're already getting um, questions here, and so I will try to keep this brief so that we have time for all of these questions that we are getting. Um, but I do want to go into this land use analysis portion of our report. This is um, a section that we add on for uh, for clients who request it. And it's looking at, uh, is is the use of the land for solar a good idea versus agriculture? Particularly um, from the perspective of the community and the perspective of the landowner. Is it a good economic trade-off for them to say, hey, I'm going to stop using this land for agriculture and lease it out for solar instead? So... Um, one of the the questions that we get a lot and things that we hear a lot in hearings as well is why do you have to use um you know agricultural land or prime farmland why can't you just put solar on marginal land that that isn't as productive and we have worked on projects that do just that but of course as uh I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but there are a lot of factors that go into site planning and determining, you know, where a solar project is viable. Uh, and so if a site is desirable um, and the lease makes more sense for the landowner, then uh, from an economics point of view, that is a good use of the land to switch from agriculture to solar. So their, their key factor in coming to a decision for the landowner is going to be, is the solar lease that I'm, uh, the payments from the solar lease, are those going to exceed my expected profits from farming? And so we, um, we take a look at the expected profits from farming based on the historical data from their area, um, from the crops that are prevalent in their area. And so... Uh, and and the other thing that we run into somewhat with hearings and conversations about this of people will come having done sort of back of napkin calculations and um, sometimes I find that they don't take all of the costs into account when trying to say is is agriculture a better use than solar because uh, there's quite a bit of cost involved in farming as well. So you don't want to just look at the, the price that you're getting for corn or soybeans. You want to look at what is the, the cost of farming as well and get to that net profit. What's the opportunity cost of the farmer's time? Um, the cost of equipment, seed, fertilizer, all of those things need to be taken into account when making this decision. So we take those things into account and arrive at this net cash income per farm. Um, and then we, we want to simulate multiple futures of what profits will be using a Monte Carlo simulation. So Monte Carlo simulation is, is basically just uh, um, simulations that incorporate some degree of randomness and you run lots of simulations to get a sense for the range of possibilities uh, that uh, that you could see. So, you know, what if corn prices spike in, you know, 2026 and stay there, you know, because if, if corn prices go up, they could stay there, they could continue to rise. That's new data that the model is taking into account. So we want to look at both those high-end simulations and low-end simulations, while understanding that the solar lease certainly gives them more certainty about what income to expect over time. You know, 
So what we've seen is, and here's an example, is if a solar lease pays $800 per acre, for example, landowner gets $6 per bushel of corn, they get a total revenue of ten fifty per acre for the year. But when you take out the costs, it's $540 per acre. And so, um, oh, the, the net profit rather is $510 per acre. Um, the solar lease in that case would exceed the net profit of farming. So the landowner would choose the solar lease. So that would be an example of one simulation that we do. Then we do that 500 times to see, okay, out into the future, you know, if those net profits increase, let's say they don't get $6 per bushel of corn, let's say they get $12 per bushel of corn. And so we're looking at those, that range of possibilities that, uh, based on the historical data that we have for price of corn, for the costs associated with farming, what are those range of outcomes that are possible into the future? And in what cases would the landowner choose the solar lease? I've run a lot of these. In many, many cases, there's not a single simulation of the 500 that exceeds the solar lease. And so the landowner behaving from an economic uh, standpoint, if they're choosing, you know, what um, is best for them economically, they choose that solar lease every single time. Um, there are some simulations. I've not seen any where um, the agricultural profits exceed the solar lease the majority of the time, but we've seen several with, you know, five simulations that exceed or 15 simulations that exceed out of the 500 and so that can happen because we're incorporating that's the the edge of the bell curve there um that we're seeing and so they are giving up the chance that they're going to see that very very edge of the bell curve but the certainty of the solar lease um is going to and the fact that the solar lease is going to be higher in the majority of situations the majority of scenarios means that the landowner should choose the solar lease um now we're talking a lot about lease amounts those are sensitive proprietary data and so in in our reports we don't report the actual lease amount we compare the profit per farm to the um prices and yields and so we show how much prices would have to increase or how much yields would have to increase, what the profit per farm would have to be, what the max scenario is, if there are any scenarios. So we uh, we do need that lease amount to run these simulations, but that's not something that we report publicly. Um, the last piece of things that we do here is take a look at the yield increase. So Particularly, this is for corn and soybean, which are two of the most prevalent crops and in areas where ag is switching to solar. Um, those yields have increased over time. The amount of corn or soybean that you can get out of an acre is going up over time. And we can see that historical trend, not only nationwide, but in each particular county. Uh, just as technology has increased, as farming uh, has gotten more efficient, we're seeing yields increase. And so we hear a lot, you know, you can't take uh, agricultural land out of production. People need that food. Well, we wanted to look at because yields are increasing. If you take, you know, a thousand of the hundred thousand acres out of production in a county, but the remaining 99,000 are producing more corn or more soybean, how long will it take for the remaining agricultural land to make up for the lost acreage that's producing no corn? In most circumstances, we've seen it take less than a year, sometimes up to two years, but we're talking about a small amount of the total acreage in the county that's being taken out of production and these yields are increasing year over year. And so you can get the same amount of corn out of a county with less acreage within a year, two years. So that's another thing that we include in the uh, land use analysis here. 
that's going to wrap up my presentation for today. I see we have some questions. I will turn it back over to Ethan. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, we are going to dive into the Q&A portion of our webinar, and we're going to get through as many of these questions as we can. So let's dive into it. Um, Dave, for you, we've got a question here that says, if a study like this isn't required as a part of a permitting process, when do you recommend getting a report like this done timeline-wise? And they've given a few options of pre-permitting process or during or before the local or before state. Yeah, I think um, what we've seen uh, now uh, over time is that uh, developers are using these reports earlier and earlier in um, their discussions with local permitting officials or just local um, um, county officials because, you know, as they go in and initially talk about a project, one of the first things that a decision maker is going to um, say is kind of what's in it for me. So to have uh, those numbers, at least the order of magnitude, oftentimes, you know, the land hasn't been secured. You don't know the exact boundaries of a project, but maybe due to your uh, interconnection in the queue, you might know or have a target for the project size. If we know project size, we can get a pretty good ballpark estimate of what those uh, property taxes are going to be based on um, our experience as well as those jobs impact. So it's very preliminary, but I think the earlier you can do that, the first even meeting with um, with local folks would be a, a good time to have those numbers in your hip pocket. And then, you know, we can refine them uh, as time goes on, but I think that's um, very helpful to have very, very early on in the process. Great, thanks. Um, our next question here is, how do you address communities that do not trust third parties either, thinking that they have been bought by developers? Do you have state-specific researchers that also reside in the states they focus on? We, um, we, we do face that question uh, a number of times where they'll, um, if they don't trust the developer, they say, well, you're just a paid consultant, so you're just going to say whatever the developer wants you to say. And uh, usually uh, my uh, comeback to, to that is to really say, we, we have laid out all our assumptions, say for property taxes, here are all our assumptions. Here's the methodology that the state has mandated. It's in the law. And here are our calculations on a year-by-year -year basis for every jurisdiction. And we publish the tax rate, the way we came up with the numbers. Where could you tell us how we have erred in our calculation? What did, what did we assume that was wrong? And uh, usually they're dismissive uh, uh, of that. Um, because they just want to dismiss the, the whole thing. The best uh, scenario that I've seen is having, if you're, if you're at the local level, having the county assessor there in the meeting. And sometimes the county assessor gets kind of caught up in the politics of the, the whole situation because they might know somebody um, locally is you know, is not in favor of the project. And so they might fear for their jobs or they might just not want to speak uh, publicly. Um, but when push comes to shove, and if I know that person's in the room, I will ask them, can you, can you verify these facts that we have done? Are these in the fact the tax rates? Is this the way property is assessed? Are these, you know, um, a, you, nobody likes to do public math. So the county assessor doesn't want to do public math uh, in a in a hearing uh, and things. But we usually say, did, are my assumptions, you know, did, is there any error in these uh, assumptions? And usually they say, um, you know, no. Um, and, um, so we, we, I think then gives us credibility because you have local people who know how property taxes work. 
verifying uh, the numbers and the amount. Great. Our next question here is, are you able to look at net impacts in your studies? And is that something you typically analyze, taking into account any reduction in farm labor, farm equipment, and supplies, purchases, et cetera? Yeah, it is something that we can uh, take a look at um, in terms of the, um, you know, the economic impact uh, to um, agriculture, especially in those uh, supply chain impacts. Seed, fertilizer, uh, um, you know, equipment uh, dealers and so forth. What I find is that when people go to do that themselves, they usually talk about the total income of the farmer um, and uh, they'll say, well, here, here's the uh, impact here. And it's really not an apples to apples comparison because we take a lot of care in this analysis to say, where is this money going to be spent? Will it be spent in you know, the local community? So typically for a wind <clears throat> or solar project, most of the equipment costs are not impacted um, or purchased in the local community. But when people are doing a back of the envelope calculation, they'll say, oh, all of this agriculture purchase is done uh, locally. And, and yet the John Deere equipment is made out of state. The fertilizer is done at some plant. There might be some seed that's done uh, locally and stays in the local um, area. Uh, but it becomes, um, you know, difficult to explain that in terms of an apples to apples comparison. So we try not to, we, we typically don't put it in our reports, but we can run the analysis. We can uh, provide that to um, our client. Uh, but uh, knowing that it's uh, usually best to do that when somebody else raises the issue as opposed to putting that all out there uh, and then people say picking apart your um, agricultural analysis rather than the focus being on the solar the good things that solar were going to be you're giving the opposition uh, ammunition to say it, it doesn't matter how much agriculture is going away even if it's one dollar that will be a reason to oppose the the project and so we typically don't put that um, in our rep report, but if it's requested by uh, the developer, we're happy to accommodate that. Our next question here says, what would a report look like if the project was in two states? Would two separate reports be needed or would one spanning two states be needed? Yeah, the, this uh, we've we've uh, faced this situation um, typically with two two counties. A project spans two counties or even three counties, um, and in some cases two states. And uh, what we find oftentimes is that if we do one report where we have uh, results kind of side by side, somebody gets jealous. The the, the first question that somebody asks is not not, oh, I'm getting $3 million. It's why are they getting $4 million and I'm only getting three? And so then you say, well, it's based on the project area. It might be based on different taxing regimes. It might be based on different, um, you know, millage rate and so forth. So you're always on the defensive on whoever is in the position of the lesser amount of of benefits to explain why they're not getting, I think the presumption is we should all get equal share of things and that's just not how life works. But um, the, I, I think the thing that has worked best in my opinion has been to do separate reports. So they're not side by side, you're not hiding anything, but you're not making that jealousy factor rear its ugly head right from the get-go to and, and being on the defensive rather you're saying here's a standalone report for this here are the benefits that are coming to this state county township and here are the benefits that are coming to this other uh jurisdiction and you know they can compare the reports but you don't make it easy for them to to compare it 
Next question here says, can you please speak to the factoring in of transmission upgrades? Yeah, I don't know, uh, Chris, if you wanna take that one. Yeah, so when we get, or when we do an economic impact study, we send out a project cost input sheet to the client and the client then fills out those uh, various cost categories that we have one of them being transmission upgrades. Uh, so what you would just do is just fill that out with the necessary information, with the total cost, and then how much you would anticipate spending within the project county and the project state. We can suggest a percentage based off the economic modeling software that we use, but really what we're just trying to get at is how much money you are spending on transmission within the project county and within the project state. And then that goes into, feeds into our economic modeling. Um, sometimes uh, there's a lot that you can spend within the state or within the county. And, you know, unfortunately sometimes there isn't as much, but uh, really what we're just trying to capture is, is your money being spent in that project county in the state? And then how is that ripple effect from that spending going to affect the rest of the county and the rest of the state? And Brian, I don't know if you want to address that from a property tax uh, standpoint. Sometimes we run into transmission upgrades in terms of who's ultimately going to own the equipment yes. um, afterwards, and that can make a difference for uh, property taxes. Yes, it can. So um, in certain states, utility-owned property is handled quite differently from a property tax standpoint and is assessed at the state level and has essentially a different set of rules applied to it. Um, the um, uh, interconnection uh, equipment is also one of those categories that can either be classified as real property or personal property, depending on the state. And so there are a lot of factors that go into it. But generally, when we look at um, transmission for property tax, we want to know, is this an expenditure from the developer or is this someone else's expenditure? And that's the determination we make whether to include it in a state that uses those capital expenditures to calculate their property taxes. Great, um, we are almost out of time. So I'm going to have one more question. I, I see we have a few other questions in the Q&A and I'll be following up uh, individually to those folks. Um, but our last question here is, how does your methodology relate to NREL's JEDI model? Yeah, um, so for um, years and years, I was using uh, the, the uh, JEDI model. Um, and um, we, in order to get accurate results from the JEDI model, they, um, the built-in uh, analysis was only done at the state level and couldn't be done at a sub-state level with a, without purchasing uh, additional data. So we have used... Um, JEDI for a number uh, of years, um, and our methodology is very compatible with the NREL's uh, JEDI model, but we've now um, looked and have broader cost categories, a little bit more refined analysis, because we find developers have that information and we can um, uh, get better estimates. Um, we think they're better estimates than the JEDI model uh, because we get more refined cost um, data and we're using the very latest uh, in-plan multipliers, whether they be for the township, county, uh, or state. So we can be, um, com it's compatible in methodology, but we think uh, we have um, a more refined estimate um, of what those uh, economic impacts are going to be. Great. Well, thanks to our speakers and thank you all for attending our webinar. If you're interested in having us do an economic impact analysis for your project, you can reach out to me personally. My email is ethan at strategiceconomic.com. You can also visit our website. We have a page on our website that has all the 
reports that have been publicly published. Um, you can check out our library there. And then we've, we've also got a contact page there. Um, so feel free to, to reach out to us if you have a project that you'd like us to do a study for. Um, again, thanks for attending our webinar and I'll be sending out the recording for this session once we have that available. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks all.